Hello, my dear friends. So if you will forgive this very informal presentation, um, I would love to continue our exploration of this wonderful and seminal work, Ask That Mountain by Dick Scott, as we've been doing. Um, so <laughs> a bit of context here. Um, you know, I said that I, I felt this was going to be a bit of an emotional exploration and I feel that it's already becoming so um, you know, one of you guys in the Soul Food Fano very sweetly suggested that I check out um, a documentary, a series that is a couple of years old, maybe like three or four years old at this point. And so I did. And this documentary, which I will link below so you can go and check it out if you're kind of enjoying this series and you love history and you want to find out more about the history of um, Aotearoa, I think I think this um this series is, has been really well put together and the narrator of it is fantastic. So highly recommend it. It's titled The New Zealand Wars and it's uh, narrated by James uh, Bellish. I believe that's the pronunciation of his name. Really fantastic. So big thumbs up to you, my dear one, who recommended that uh, I watch that. It really is an accompaniment to this um to, to reading of this book, right? I'm literally still at the beginning. I should warn you guys, that I'm a slow reader. And that image there is, um, let me see if I can pronounce this chief's name. Wirimu Kingi Te Rangi Teke, Rangi Take, born in 1795 to 1882. Forgive me, my dear Maori friends, if I have mispronounced the name. Can you see that? Um, so where I'm at with this um, in the book is just reading about really the first um, the first kind of um, gunshots that rung out. Yes, it says here um, they fired the first shots of New Zealand's 10 year war on 17th of March 1860 when 12 and 24 pounder um, field guns and a naval rocket tube poured a barrage of shells into a small stockade on the outskirts of Waitara. So um, I think what I'm learning, guys, and if you're new around here, you're so warmly welcome. And I encourage you to go back and just check if you've missed any episodes of this, which you will have if you're just starting here. Um, um, yeah, I've literally just woken up, guys, and I wanted to uh, share this. So <laughs> I'm like on my second cup of coffee. My voice will, will probably change as I do this. <laughs> no makeup. Um, yeah, but I really wanted just to kind of share my real feelings about this and I watched the documentary um kind of in two halves because I got home from work and it was late so we you know just winding down um for the weekend I didn't watch that whole uh, first episode of the New Zealand Wars that documentary watched part of it watched part of it this morning and it just left me feeling really a lot of emotions. Um, so coupled with going back to the book and my own thoughts and some synchronicity, which I will share with you, I'm just really struck by just the power and great violence that kind of tore through the land that I now stand on. Um, it's quite mind blowing. The use of racial slurs and the N word, which were used against Maori people, um, and some of the language that has persisted, um, even to the point where some of it I can remember, you, you know, in the UK, seeing, you know, slurs written in graffiti. And that kind of blew my mind. It also made sense of what some of my Māori friends, some of the people I know, um, have shared with me about about that the use of that N-word. Such a hideous word, isn't it? And when it's, when it's used that way. Um, yeah, I don't want to get into a whole kind of... Um, discussion around that because I think I think it's it's really complex I don't I don't some people you know a lot of black people will say um that word is just unacceptable in any context not in music not in poetry not anywhere we should never ever utter it others might argue that that black people have kind of taken it back and created even you could argue you know a lot of money around that word and around um using it in art and literature and kind of really taking that power back. You know, that's a really complex debate and I don't wanna get into that, but I was just so struck that, you know, Māori have had this word inflicted upon them way back in the, you know, in history. 
um, just in the same way that it was it would have been used, no doubt, in Africa uh, by the colonialists. So I was really struck by that. I think another point that I feel is very important, and especially um, for any Europeans who are interested in this, and maybe you've just discovered my channel, you, again, you're really warmly welcome. The only prerequisite for, for being here and being part of the Soul Food Fano is that, you know, you need to adhere to those basic tenets of loving respect um, for all of us and for all points of view. It doesn't matter if we don't all agree, but we have to do that. Um, if we're disagreeing, we have to do that respectfully. I really have no tolerance for um, disrespect, racism and, you know, stupidity, really, I suppose, to put it bluntly. <laughs> you, know, so, you know, I'm loving our community um, as it stands and as it's growing. I just feel like uh, YouTube have fixed something. And so the people who are finding this content are really much more um, at the level that we expect in the Soul Food Fano. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the best way of measuring whether it's for you or not, this whole series and, and all of my creative content on YouTube and anywhere, and if you want to be, and you're thinking, I don't know, what's all this soul food Fano about, you know, <laughs> if you're thinking that, then please just check out a bit more of my body of work before kind of rushing to leave a comment, rushing to make a judgment, because you probably haven't really got the measure by just watching one episode of one series or anything so um yeah that would be my only um recommendation if you are new around here but you know i i have a really open welcome for everyone who is um loving kind respectful and hopefully intelligent too because we are intelligent around here we are thoughtful so um yeah and i think you know the other thing that james bellish makes in this documentary is that you know the history books um that he had i mean i would say in 2017 when i assumed that that documentary was filmed he already looked like he was in his 40s 50s 50s probably um european descent you know person of european descent but you know i for me because when he said you know we didn't learn this at school he's obviously kiwi right um, he said, we didn't learn this at school and we learned a sanitized version of history where, you know, Pakeha and Māori had this very clean fight where everyone kept their gloves on and um, at the end of the day, Pakeha and Māori kissed and made up and we all lived happily ever after, preserving this idea of Aotearoa as this kind of haven of racial, um, you know, equity and all of this kind of thing. And I thought that was so interesting that he made that observation. This is the narrator because I feel that, that that I can relate to that and that's that resonates f with my own experience of living here now for a couple of years in Aotearoa, that um, I think it's it's possibly, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I wonder where that pressure comes from to preserve the, um, the illusion that there is this total racial harmony and we all, you know, ride on the backs of dolphins to get to work. You know, I think that Tim Minchin, the com uh, comedian, really gifted comedian, go check out his work if you haven't already. I, I kind of love him. He's really creative. He brings in music and stuff in his comedy. And he was here in Altero recently and, and my husband went to see him. I didn't see him, but one of the things he said was in, in you know, one of his um, uh, comedy bits was just about, yeah, this this idea that in Altero we're just living in this paradise where we ride to work on the backs of dolphins. I think, you know, I've noticed, yeah, you know, as I've mentioned this before, that defensiveness that comes through. To be honest with you, I feel that it's, in my experience, at least what I'm seeing in my comment section, it's not, this is no deep research, guys, it's not deep, right? But it's just interesting that it, it seems to be the people who kind of get like, mm, well, if you don't like it, why don't you F off? You know, in the comments, like, uh, our, the defense, that defensiveness is sometimes, maybe I, it's unfair to say it's always people of European descent who are making those kinds of comments. Probably there are some Māori people who've made similar comments. So they've watched like two seconds of something I've said and then immediately gone to the comment section you know what do they call it a uh, keyboard warrior and leaving some snarky or outright rude you know comments that you know we just don't tolerate around here so yeah be warned you will be reported and um and possibly worse you know that this kind of stuff is actually criminalized now in Altero, which i think is fantastic you know cyber bullying and cyber stalking any of that stuff it's just not necessary if you don't agree if you really can't stomach it just move on right we don't want another war <laughs> in, our, in our community but i just i just thought that was a really important insight that james bellish made about the fact that there is this um desire to preserve um the the kind of illusion that there's been well there were wars here but they weren't that bad 
they were really bad they were really bloody and really and I think that's why as I said I, I was feeling a bit emotional watching the the latter end of that documentary as I said I will link it below if you're interested I think it's really good I love the fact that it doesn't seem to be kind of weighted either for the Brits or for the Maori I feel like it's a, a kind of neutral account um if anything actually he's I would say just as a psychotherapist listening to the intonation of his voice and the way he presents the material that he's probably more on the side of Maori actually and that might not be a good thing or a bad thing whatever but I was just struck by that that it wasn't just about I mean if I watched a BBC documentary on the same the same material the same moment in time in history I think it would be quite different uh, but I think that's a really important point, especially uh, for all of us. I think that that's always the risk of history, isn't it? And it's interesting that at the end of that uh, part one of that documentary, which I do, do feel really dovetails with this book, right? He was saying that, you know, really the Brits, the British won the New Zealand wars by the pen when they'd lost by the sword, because in the pen, in, in writing, we can say anything, can't we? And eventually, if we have the kind of... Um, if we're the kind of dominant people, you know, the English language is a very dominant language. The British Empire was very dominant and successful around the world in all the conquests that they made. So it's like, ultimately, you know, if you have that kind of power, yeah, you can write history as you want it to. But the reality, I think, was quite different. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to just bring in a bit of my own personal, you know, because this is this does feel personal watching this, these series, reading this book, it, it's personal because I live in Taranaki and um, I was I happened to, to speak to a, a Māori um, taxi driver the other day and he was telling me about um, the fact that actually his his ancestry is really interesting and complex is both European and Māori and in, uh, according to his own words, you know, very much linked to the chiefs ultimately would have harked back to that time in history where, um, you know, his bloodline really goes back to those really um, incredible Māori, you know, chiefs who, you know, when you watch this documentary, it really brings to life what I'm reading in this wonderful book, because in a way, what you see is how, I think, you know, for me, this is just my personal perspective, but how the 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 land really rose up to meet the Maori warriors, and I feel like that is why they had such great success. Because, you know, the the that's Tangata Fenua, you know, that the people of the land. This is their land, and you know, Europeans were were here from far far away. You know, there was a lovely line in the documentary about you know one of the. Um, the chiefs and I will add a I'll add his name because it momentarily escapes me but I'll add his name here on the screen somewhere but you know he was saying you know you 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 God gave you Britain and God gave Maori this land so you can't come here and just think that you're going to just take over completely I think what's exceptional in in what I'm learning is that the the, the spirit of the willingness to cooperate um, as long as there was an understanding that this remains Māori land. And of course, you know, we know enough about British history and, and the kind of ways and means that the Brits kind of conquered so many areas around the world that they didn't necessarily play fair. Come on, let's be real. And so I think, you know, that's the whole point of the Treaty of Watangi, you know, that, that it was something was signed, but really, you know, it, there, was, there was a lot more um, behind the scenes that was being plotted. Basically, there was there was this idea of a lot of subterfuge and, um, you know, just really outright lies that were told about um, really, on, you know, honouring that treaty. The New Zealand wars, you know, raged across the North Island for 30 years. That's such a long time. That would be like most of my life. You know, I'm, you know, I'm in my 40s. But when you think of it, when you try and kind of get your head around, like imagine you'd lived in a country where for most of your life it'd been at war. I mean, there would have been a whole generation, uh, you know, who would have lived under that shadow of the, you know, the fire and the mortars and the bombs and artillery it's kind of incredible really when you think of it that way i thought it might be useful my friends just to literally show you on the website um what that looks like if you have any issues around land disputes this is the team at gq who would be looking after you so i highly recommend that you reach out to gq 
they are my sponsors and I'm so honored to be connected with this legal firm of great integrity. Um, and I would say Manna actually, who really do care about our Māori Fano. And that's what the website looks like. I was struck by that taxi driver that I just mentioned. Somewhere near where I lived, this taxi driver said, you know, this this was a pa, you know? And so watching this documentary um, and learning what a pa really, what really was, and, you know, just like a stronghold and a, a place, the place where kind of Māori kind of strategized and often attacked their enemy, um, you know, with such incredible skill, I think that's the thing that is is hard to to get your head around if you you know, unless you and that, and that's why visuals are so useful. But really, these Māori in my head were engineers. You know, they created the the first kind of underground warfare, if you like. And I don't have all the terminology, guys. Forgive me for that. But you know, basically, um, you know, many of these warriors came up with. Um, on their on these paths would would kind of create underground um tunnels from where they could attack um the the soldiers coming you know coming to kill them from without even being seen you know and with far fewer men you know one of the things that this documentary highlighted really beautifully was that you know this was the the crown's army the the british british finest you know coming at them um and the maori were kind of family men they were part-time soldiers effectively and yet it didn't matter they crushed you know the opposition they crushed them in many of these um kind of um eruptions so i, I don't know it, it just it just feels yeah as i say it, it just feels really close to home literally you know when when i'm i'm learning about this history and it's coming to life i'd like to read for you a little bit from the book um this is page 36 my friends out of peaceful struggle, Taranaki would negotiate its own treaty, a treaty between equals. In the not far distant future, Tefiti said, lion and lamb, hawk and wren, cat and mouse would live in harmony. Pakeha and Māori would live side by side. But the chieftainship of the land would remain with its owners, the Māori. Europeans could stay on land already occupied, more could settle, but there was to be no freehold. They could not cut up the blanket that belonged to the people. The only land sold or purchased in the whole of the Bible was for burial grounds. Tefiti announced a program. Uh, Tefiti was this very peaceful warrior. Um, that had four stages. The day of Takehanga, his 1869 announcement of freedom from Pakeha authority, the Akarama, the uh, Asob, uh, Asobdama, I'm not sure about that word guys, transaction of Judas Iscariot, Tupa, pu, Tupa Paku, the day of death and Aranga, the day of reckoning or resurrection when the results of struggle would rise to the surface and be harvested. Behind rich imagery and ambiguity, a revolutionary program was being proclaimed. The goal was communal prosperity for all. In immediate practical terms, Tefiti offered a course of action of tactical genius. As the Māori record later described it, Tefiti had two things to do which he considered necessary to his policy. To continually, by overt act, to assert his ownership of the confiscated lands, which from his point of view were not confiscated, and to keep from armed outbreak the most turbulent natives in New Zealand. And the first was used as a medium of securing the second. It was necessary to keep those natives employed in an unarmed struggle with the government. I will just read a, just one final passage, my friends. Perhaps it was not simply a Māori orator's use of illusion and imagery for love of the language and for gripping his audience that led Tefiti to clothe his policy in obscurities. 
Yes, that line really strikes me. Let me read it again, my friends. So Tefiti clothed his policy in obscurities that I guess would have been understood by Māori and, you know, maybe some of the Pākehā would have struggled to understand. You know, I feel like that kind of, um, it's it's still a kind of war, but it's a, it's a lot more sophisticated, isn't it? I basically feel so far that in, in reading, and I'm obviously being um, selective in what I'm reading, my friends, I do recommend the book if you have a love of history and you want to get a, more of an insight into um, history here in Aotearoa. But one of the things I feel like I'm, I'm learning just um, so far is just how tactical, um, you know, peaceful warriors like Tafiti were, that they, they didn't necessarily use like blunt force to 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 reach their goals the power of the spirituality that is so embedded in maori culture i think could have been used to great ends to effect change and to move you know to to the position that that these warriors wanted to go i think one of the things that's so striking both from that documentary i've mentioned and so far my reading is is what was um the generosity of the maori people in terms of you know, these foreigners on their land and the willingness to share. Um, I think that's that's something that I'm seeing time and time again in different examples so far um, that, that perhaps is not really spoken widely enough about. Just briefly to show you, this is what I mean. This is like a, a lovely illustration of that underground warfare that Māori kind of um, innovated. Can you see that? Isn't that amazing and beautiful? And so it meant that even with far fewer men, far less sophisticated weaponry, the Brits came with their mortars and these, all this stuff, all this technology that Māori had never seen before, but they were un, undaunted. To me, that's incredible. And of course, you know, that kind of intimate knowledge of the, the land, because it's Māori, you know, belong to this land and the land belongs to the Māori. That is like an like a, that's a home advantage that is kind of unassailable. You know what are you going to do if you're foreign and you're coming? You you have to figure it all out. You might be able to get your maps and work things out just through mathematical means, but the people know the land in their bones. So of course, you know these warriors could create incredible um, strongholds underground, <laughs> right under the noses of the of the Brits. Um, in many cases, in a way, you know, and, and kind of defeat them. I love this image too, my friends. I think if you can see that, it, it shows the um, British soldiers with their swords. I hope that comes through okay. And as, it, as the caption says, these were not ornamental. These were swords for killing. And this is at Parehaka. Just on this point of this illusion of um, harmony, racial harmony, and um, uh, yes, and all is wellness, if you will. Um, just as a passage here that I found again, again in the wonderful book, and I'll just read it to you, just on that note, right? Colonel Trimble, a Taranaki MP, had warned Parliament that there were many who would knock a Māori on the head, just as they would a mad dog if war broke out. And now every hill and valley was alive with enthusiastic amateurs waiting for the first shot to signal the attack. In camp, in the war camps, I guess, there had been drunken boasting as to who would shoot the first Māori. So this was around the surprise attack um, on the 5th of November, 1881. Is this era. Those again are the soldiers polishing a bayonet, oiling a rifle and doubtless squeezing a sentimental tune. The armed constabulary prepare for invasion. So my friends, thank you for joining me on this kind of exploration. It really is an exploration. The reason why, you know, I'm not a linear kind of thinker really, you know, I'm kind of a creative thinker. So so it does move around in, in what I'm sharing sometimes, but I also feel that that's also the nature of the fact that um, I'm kind of learning this as I stand on the very land where this took place. History is not neat and tidy. I hope that nonetheless, a story is emerging um, that um, speaks to 
the history that's so important to you know Aotearoa and especially important to us here in Taranaki but with the overlay of my own personal experience thank you so much for joining me my friends thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Kia ora.